to another Tuesday Talkie on the Barefoot Miniatures channel. Now, I was saying Tuesday, but actually this may be released on a Thursday because the amount of content that is actually out to cover this month, I think I'm going to try and step it up to two a week for the foreseeable future. Um, and we'll just have to see how I get on with that uh, because <laughs> that would take us up to three, four videos a week. Now, if you want to see this or listen to this in podcast format, that is released to Patreons as well as the early release of all the videos. As soon as I can get them out, they're released to the Patreons and there's a link below for that. Um, and without further ado, let's get through the Black Shields. Now, this is one that actually really excites me along with the Solar Exilia um, Legion traits, I'm going to say, which tie to the Legions. Those are the two that most excited me about the book of any of them. So I thought I'd start with Black Shields and go from there. Now, Black Shields, you use this instead of a Legion trait, essentially. You've got the Beholden to Non-Rule, which means that you count as both Traitor and Loyalist. So when you play an opponent just as a pickup game, you're going to be always triggering any Legion rules or Warlord traits that that may have for the opposing force. So the one that comes to mind is Alpha Legion Warlord traits that work against Loyalist Allegiance. You will be triggering this regardless. Now, when in campaign or um, event uh, format, you're going to obviously be on the side that you're on and you can't change that in between battles. Um, and I'm, I'm just sort of assuming there that events are going to be running along the same as campaign games because they've not put events. Even like even though, I suppose earlier in the book, they start mentioning tournaments, which is actually the first time, I believe, that they've put tournament as a wording within the book. Um, but here we don't have that. We just have campaigns. Now, we've got a terrible purpose, and this is your essentially your legion trait that your Black Shields will be getting. Um, and it's the main difference between Black Shields and normal Legion Astartes, and it has some pretty wide repercussions, uh, as you'd expect. And it's actually really fun. So you get to pick up to two of them at a time um, of your Oath of Vengeance. And we'll be getting it. That will be the main part of this guide, right? Finally, there's the Courage and Conviction, which is your Warlord traits, which we'll get onto right after the Advanced Reaction. So the Advanced Reaction, let me just zoom in there a little bit, is no Lords, no Masters. So essentially when your opponent declares an assault or a charge against you, they've got the prime, if they've got the Primarch Unique or Master of the Legion special rule, so it will work in pretty much any army, except for other Black Shields with one specific, um, <laughs> except with one of the Oaths of Vengeance. And if they've just not taken a Master of the Legion, so if someone rocks up with no Right of War, your advanced reaction doesn't really work. If their charge is successful, you gain the Fearless special rule for the duration of the combat. So it's sort of the benefits of Fearless in the main, in the, in the Assault phase, without having to miss out on the Shrouded saves, which, depending on how much night vision in your opponent's force, can be a real big benefit, but some you, you want a bit more of a hittiness, right? Now, you do slightly get that, because any models that have been charged, so on your side, that are in base contact with the character unit subtype, not just independent characters, gain plus one attack, so that'll proc against all sergeants, things like that. Uh, and if in contact with the unique, so that's like special characters and primarchs, you'll gain plus two attacks for the duration of the combat. So it's something that helps out like a fair a fair bit, and it isn't limited to just those things that your fearless is limited to. So it has this like sort of double benefit um, and can work even just against a normal squad charging your normal squad if you just need that extra bit of help. Not the best Legion advanced reaction, but also I wouldn't say it's the absolute worst. It, it, I'd say it's like mid-tier, low mid, if I really had to put something down on it. Fearless is available through banners, so it pop, 
pops up quite a bit without having it to be limited to this advanced reaction. Um, and when other advanced reactions are out there that allow charges out of sequence, it's very hard to put this <laughs> higher up in a tier list. Now, yeah, that's the thoughts on the advanced reaction. I would have liked to see it maybe just plus one attack, but it's black shields, I suppose. It's, if, you, if you're playing black shields, there's either going to be really broken combos that you can do, or you're playing them for the love of black shields. And it's an advanced reaction. I mean, some of them are just shoot an extra time, which I don't know, sounds very good, but it strikes me about as good as that. It can tip the favor of a combat in your direction sometimes and that's the same with the shooting reactions right so next we've got the warlord traits first we've got bloody tyrant your warlord gains fear one uh, which affects all friendly models as well as enemy models uh, this doesn't include any the warlord model with the trait which is unaffected so your own unit using your own warlord's leadership it won't actually matter because you'll just take the highest leadership in the squad. Should a friendly unit affected by this fear one <laughs> and under the control of the player who's the warlord is this trait, so not an ally if you're playing a 2v2 game, be forced to fall back or become pinned. Instead, remove a single model as a casualty and you can't take a saving throw or damage mitigation. You neither become pinned or fall back. Instead, you remain in place without further effect, or if locked in combat, remains locked in combat. Cool, it's like a Commissar. It's the same bloody Tyrant trait, or very similar to the Militia trait. I actually really like it. Um, you get an additional reaction in the Assault phase, which some of the stronger lists, whether this will help you out much, but some of the stronger lists in Heresy, like I do think shooting, very, very good, high mid-tier, and it gets the legions that are good at shooting gets really up there. But when you get up to the, the absolute top, to me, it starts becoming an assault based game. So assault reactions are still good for that hold the line where you can choose it anywhere. Your own reaction ties into that. Quite nice. And I like it because it mitigates leadership based effects, which we find a much more effect to this addition compared to previous editions of Heresy. So overall, a, a good, flavoursome, good, rules-wise trait. God, struggling for words this morning. So then we've got Forgotten Hero. If during the shooting phase, your Warlord is assigned a wound, so it can be anything from a Bolt Pistol, Laz Gun, to a Laz Cannon, if you really wanted to tank a Laz Cannon, when you're assigned a wound, then all friendly models gain plus one weapon skill and strength until the next time, the end of the turn in which you either charge or a charge. So the next combat that you fight, you will have plus one weapon skill and strength. Um, not as good as having one weapon skill all the time, I don't think, but the fact that you can just, and it can only be triggered by shooting. So if they know this, they just don't fire their bolt pistols or whatever into your Warlord's unit, because you don't really want to be tanking lads cannons as much as I've flippantly said that before. I think it is very good. You gain an additional shooting phase reaction as well. So you can add Shrouded to your Warlord to keep him more, <laughs> to keep him higher in wounds than you otherwise would. But yeah, I, th I think it's a really good Warlord trait, especially with how the hit chart works, where if you're one weapon skill higher, it can be really clutch to mitigate a load more incoming damage in an assault that your Warlord's involved in. Plus one strength can end up triggering a lot more things like, say, a power axe with the Forgotten Hero and some rad grenades with, a, say, a Moratap joined to the squad can mean that you're now doubling out your opponents and it's obviously easy access to getting power axes over things which require plus two strength. And because it works both when you were charged and when you were charging, if you were charged, and it's, it's also not a, a charging... Uh, bonus so i suppose all the time like the sons of horus bonus it's good it's good it's, it needs you wounded on twos with power axes next we've got twisted strategist so at the start of any game turn before the player's movement phase the warlord trait is on the battlefield and not be removed as a casualty 
then select one unit and one of these special rules and apply them together. So you've got Shrouded 6 plus, Rampage 1, Counter Attack 1, Precision Shots 6, and you gain an additional movement phase reaction. Now, obviously having a tailorable um, special rule is situationally very good. Now, we all know how good Las Cannon squads are, Precision Shots 6 plus on 10 Melters, Las Cannons, things like that can just be absolutely amazing. Counter Attack 1 to stack to other things, really useful. Rampage, really, really useful. Shroud 6 Plus, I'm never really a fan of 6 up saves. They they don't tend to come into it as much as I would. They don't trigger the effect enough for me to really think they're useful. I think it's a useful wall trait right? because you can apply their than where you want. I'm just not as in love with it as Forgotten Hero or Bloody Tyrant, which have much more powerful effects, I would say, for say Bloody Tyrant, allowing you to effectively have Fearless for the cost of a one wound model is very good. Now, of all three of them, I although I like Twisted Strategist the least, I do like them all. It's a, a good set, solid Warlord traits. Not the best, again, but also absolutely not the worst, I would say. Um, you're not losing control of any of your units. Um, they've all got tangible benefits, and even Twisted Strategist, where the benefits aren't amazing, you're tailoring them each turn to each unit. So we all know how good that... Or if you've played Dark Angels, where people are tailoring their units with different wings... We know how good that can be, um, even with the small benefit. It's just the small benefit in the right place. So, yeah, I really like the Warlord traits from Black Shields. And with that, we'll get on to the main part of this rundown. So, that is the Oaths of Vengeance. So, you can take two options of an Oath of Vengeance. So, these will combine together. They affect all models that have Legion of Astartes Black Shields, excluding models with the unique unit subtype, uh, and you can't select the same oath twice. The Oath of Vengeance is the very core of each Black Shield warband, and one's detail should not be changed from battle to battle. So basically it's saying that when you select them for your army, this is a bit of a theme thing, don't, don't be changing them out all the time, and it's also... Basically, when you go to an event you and even make a game with your opponent, you shouldn't know what your opponent is taking or choosing before you choose your own Oath of Vengeance and Wrath. Obviously, very hard to police in pickup games. Not that anyone needs to police it. But I like that they've included that in here, that it's more of a tailor your force to what you want your force to be and stick to that, stick to your guns, see it through. And... It's perfect for the Black Shields because it's it's very much a fluff army than it is meant to be like a super uh, balanced tournament army, I don't think. I'm going to use that word tournament there because they've put it elsewhere in the book. Um, so we've got the first one, the Oath of Inter the Eternal Vendetta. Basically, choose a Legion of Astartes X special rule. Um, for example, you've got, it gives an example of it world eaters blood angels and you decide it before the battle is begun so you you take your vendetta and this sort of if you want to be really fluffy you choose always the one every time but this doesn't cross over with infirmity of purpose you choose it against your opponent's force is the intention i think here um and it's certainly written that way and you get plus one to hit of any weapons with the melee type against that legion it doesn't affect gets hops Though I don't, I can't think of any gets hot melee types off the top of my head. Um, but I think I, that must just be in there for, <laughs> for like, that must just be in there for another Oath of Vengeance, which the Xenoth Deathlocks. Oh, let, let's skip ahead, let's skip ahead. Let's see if the Oath of Vengeance that includes Xenoth Deathlocks. Hmm. 
Mm. So even Halo Blades from a further taint of Xenos, Ven Oath of Vengeance, don't have anything that triggers on a one in combat. So just it, it doesn't really come into effect. It's just future proofing, maybe. Which is a very good effect to get that plus one to hit. It means that your weapon skill fives will hit weapon skill fours on a two, which is insanely good. Now, the downside to this Oath of Vengeance is that you've got to declare a charge if you're within 12. As much as losing control of your unit to shooting attacks is cripplingly bad, I would say, L having to charge, if you can charge, I don't find to be so much of a downside because it at least gains you that surge move a lot of the time you just want to be doing anyway for that surge obviously it will come into it if you've got a smaller unit that you really want to preserve but you win some you lose some and plus one to hit on the lead weapons is incredibly good really like this oath of vengeance quite fluffy and yeah it's, there's nothing really that mentally bad about it that would stop me taking it. We've got the Panoply of Old X, like Old Terror. So basically you get access to the unique war gear options from the Legion Astartes that you choose as your Legion Panoply of Old X. So that doesn't give you access to things which are restricted to detachments of the faction. So like you won't gain fire drakes or something like that but what you do get is the war gear so let's go through some of the good pieces of war gear that you might want to if you were thinking about the power level want to take because otherwise if you say want to take uh, i don't know it's all the legions have unique war gear so if you have a theme for your force it's worthwhile taking this potentially Although it may be, in some Legion's case, worthwhile focusing on, on other things like Eternal Vendetta versus that force or how the story is affecting your Black Shields in a certain way. And yeah, let's get, let's get into the good ones anyway. So the first one that I've selected as a good choice would be Salamanders. Obviously, access to Dragon Breath weapons is, is okay. Is okay. You've got access to the Dragon Scale, Scale Short, Storm Shield, and Elder Drake Mantle. And that is why I selected these. So plus one to their invulnerable save. Access to the three up in Von, very important in Heresy 2. I think we all know how good access to Storm Shields and three up saves is. And you've also got access to the Mantle of the Elder Drake, which gives you a prayer to battle hardened one for 35 points. Definitely worth it for, to stop being doubled out. It gives some sort of mitigation versus the Thunderhammers because, and even Dreadnoughts, because largely it's the doubling out combined with the Brutal that tends to do people in rather than just having Brutal. Especially when you then have a Storm Shield on top of that, so you've got a three up and you're not getting doubled out. I think it's very, very powerful. It also means that your Terminators will have access to that Storm Shield. And when we're thinking about Black Shields, I do actually think, although you've got access to old Nocturne here, it doesn't directly have to affect Nocturne. I mean, we see just air in Terminators with Storm Shields and there's no other way of representing them in the game than either taking Fists or... Like this, this might go against what people, a lot of people think, but he's, when you're designing your Black Shield Force, to me, it's more of a sandbox. And how else do you represent Terminators with shields that we see elsewhere in the books than just choosing one of these? I think that's a good option. Salamanders, Mantle the Elder Drake, Storm Shield. So Imperial Fists, I think this one was always going to crop up, right? Because Tartarus can take a three up save with it, you've got a three up save and can sweep which is very good. You don't get that on the Salamanders. Obviously, you're missing out on the Elder Drake mantle, but having that three-up save and sweeping is crazy. You get Teleport Strike, and that's Deep Strike on Terminators for 20 points. 
singular deep striking units not amazing amazing but you get access to it you don't have to use it it's just one of the things thrown in there solarite power power gauntlets you've got strength 10 and just unwieldy at ap1 so you can get two close combat weapons and you're just exchanging a thunder hammer for that or a power fist for five points which is very good that plus one attack without having to take two specialist weapons is very very good at strength 10 you're just punching people in the rear and i think glancing or am anything but a one uh glancing anything but a land raider next we've got the iliastus assault cannon and four shots the rending strength six range 24 and just being able to change heavy flamers for that crops up so often like with the dreadios having the the nip the nipple um Assault cannons just makes them so much better. Same with on a Leviathan nipple assault cannons. So, the, and also in the heavy weapon squads, I suppose as well. Here you can stack that into. Obviously, you're not getting access to the Castellan to make those uh, line, but the amount of things that they've got, if you just transplant that onto a Black Shields force, I think it's worth shouting out for that three up save potential of a teleport strike. Um, Solarite Gauntlets and Iliastis Assault Cannons. Now, next, I've gone a little more out there. And Raven Guard, with the Raven's Talons rending on a 5 with Shred, very, very good. And with the two paired weapons of two Raven's Talons. I mean, Dark Fury is a ripping through everyone's armies, right? And having access to that, along with the original... Oath of Vengeance, the Eternal Vendetta. Eternal Vendetta, have I just got that right? Eternal... Yes, I did get it right, Eternal Vendetta. Um, just having access to that, so that plus one to hit, and then getting Rending, Shred, brilliant. Access to Infra Visors to get you shooting units, Night Vision, and I know that's just on the Sergeant, but it confers to the squad. Also gains that plus one Ballistic skill. And he's only 10 points, so less than uh, Prey Sight for Night Lords. Very, very good. So you've got a solid combat weapon, a solid upgrade to your shooting units. And then Camellia Line for the 6-up Shrouded. And it adding to your existing version of Shrouded. Very, very good. And the COVID Pattern Jump Pack. COVID Pattern Jump Pack, sorry. For the movement 14. One thing to say about the Raven Guard is as well, I think the, the hit and run style of warfare very much suits the Black Shields. So it ties in with their guerrilla warfare style out on the fringes, out from the lines of supply, because that's like sort of baked into the background of Raven Guard as well, especially after it after Istvan 5. So that's definitely worth a look in. And then finally, I've <laughs> left it out here, but the Armory of the Iron Hands to gain access to Cyber Familiars for the three up save on your characters, grab Shredders to replace Flamers with the two shot Haywire. You'll also get access to the Gravitat if you do that, which is incredibly good. You'll also get access to Blessed Auto Simacra on a it will not die six up because you don't add that Medusa and scales to make it a five. And the Amatus Necrotechnica sort of fits in well for that fear bubble and the wounds, meaning that you get back hull points. I I think it fits in well with like the esoteric Black Shields force. Now Obviously, every Legion has their own unique war gear, so there's no end to how you can theme your force taking the that weapons of old X special rule. Like obviously, my Iron Warriors come to mind for me. Having those, those grab mauls, how my force could fight whilst being out of supply or removed from the Legion proper, I think the Black Shields really comes into it nicely for. Um, so it's worth just theming it to your force as well as me just having said some of the better ones that sprung to my mind as we go through. 
So next we've got only death to duty end. Basically, whenever you have to take a morale check um, in any phase, no dice are rolled. You passed it automatically, and instead you suffer D3 wounds in which you can only take invulnerable saves against. It doesn't affect pinning checks or any other kind of leadership check. But I think it's very, very useful to just have basically reliability within your force, like playing Iron Warriors last edition, where it was you just ignored shooting base morale checks. Incredibly, incredibly good. This brings that back in an addition where there's essentially more things that can cause you to fail a morale check with stacking your fear, um, lower leadership in general. The final thing to say about this oath is that it denies victory points to your opponent for killing your units, which is incredibly, incredibly useful. It essentially takes out the Slay the Warlord trait as well as any victory points that might have been gained through um, through Headhunter Leviathan or through For Whom the Bell Tolls. And combined with the next oath can make an incredibly powerful combination where you're scoring lots of victory points, denying them to your enemy and making it very, very hard for your opponent to win the game just based on your own army. It's something to... Sagi Amazan, very, very good right of war. It sort of stealthed for a little bit until people started realising how much of an impact that would make on the game. And this is an Oath of Vengeance that essentially gives you that. And then combined with the next one, scoring points, incredibly, incredibly good. And can fit in nicely with pretty much any Space Marine force because they all fight to the death, right? Next, we've got the Spoils of Victory. And this is one of the best ones within here because it provides victory points outside of the game structure. Essentially, whenever you would make a sweep in advance, instead of doing that, you roll a dice on a four plus, you gain a victory point. Now, it doesn't say you can choose to do that. It's you've got to do that. But gaining a victory point instead of just finishing off a squad is largely going to be the way to go every time you have to do it. In fact, it means that you can do this multiple times against the same squad if you just keep winning that combat. So very, very good. You're getting points outside of the scoring structure of the game. Anyone that didn't play Demons in first edition, they used to get victory points based off their own objectives for the game rather than tied to the missions. And that sort of broke Demons and there had to be rules implemented that they did in fact follow the mission. Um, and this is one that could do it outside of that in the same way. I can see everyone having to be cautious with this. And it is definitely one of the better ones, I would say. If not one of the best ones. If you have a Cataphracty Terminator suit, um, which means that you don't sweep, you gain no benefit from the oath. It's fair enough, right? It, it's going to disincentivize you from playing um, Cataphracty. But if, say, you had the weapons of Ancient Terror or Ancient X, you, would, you could take a three up invulnerable say Tartarus squad and then instead of sweeping gain points every time um, which would be very very powerful. Next we get an eternity of war in which anytime a unit with this oath fails morale check instead of falling back you instead make a consolidate move so that's in any direction that you want and don't count as having fallen back because you've not done it. Very very good right because it maintains control of your units in the same way as only in death does duty end does it gives you additional movement on a force that with this is likely going to want to be in combat because the downside to it is that if you haven't been at the end of your own turn in combat your unit suffers a single wound with no th saving throws or damage mitigations of any type allocated by the controlling player so your last cannon squad is going to start taking these hits if you take an eternity of war. It is, however, a benefit if your last cannon squad gets fired at, you fail a morale check. Instead of falling back, you just consolidate and actually reposition into a better place. It's just all around very good, I think. It's, it's worth taking that one 
wound a turn because obviously it does have its drawbacks but for a melee focused army definitely worth it to take a couple of wounds on a couple of squads so that you get an additional four inches of movement every time you fail a morale check rather than not being able to charge for a turn and actually getting further away from your opponent next we've got the flesh is weak sounding very iron hands here so this one is your infantry and cavalry unit types change that for automata and gain the feel no pain five plus special rule the downside to this is that if you can make a shooting attack in your shooting phase you must make it and target the closest enemy unit uh, that is within line of sight and a valid target of a shooting attack if there are two targets equally close, you can choose. Um, and if you've not got a weapon that's capable of wounding or causing a glancing hit to the potential target, then you can ignore it. So your bolters don't have to fire at a land raider. Basically, any model with the Psycho subtype loses it, so you just won't be taking Librarians or the Legacy of Nikea Oath, which we're about to come on to. Um, and your transports basically gain an automata transport bay as well as three additional capacity on the face of it a five up feel no pain is is very good is very good to so just have it free all the time very good the drawback having played iron warriors with the legion warlord traits a fair amount losing control of your shooting attacks and that's just on one unit for me but this is the entire army Losing control of your unit shooting attacks is horrendously bad. It means that your last cannon squad is going to be focusing on the nearest unit, be that a squad of tactical marines, a rhino, or a land raider. Like, it just doesn't make any sense for your target priority. It could be very good if you're actually taking an assault focused army where you don't actually care about where your shooting is going because you're always going to be sh or you're going to have to just position yourself to be within within charge range and closest to what you want to assault so that you fire in there anyway and then just don't have any rapid fire weapons but that is such a limitation and that's part of it i suppose it's yeah, the, when the limitations are sort of 50 50 with the benefits it's maybe where it should be in game design but with some of the ones being so so good the drawback to this is so crushing that i don't i couldn't see myself or anyone taking it as part of a force next we go on to the legacy of nikea which isn't compatible with the flesh is weak because the flesh is weak um you can't use psychic weapons psychic powers so even though you can select it you wouldn't be able to use it Essentially, what the Legacy of Nikea is doing is that your warband has gone off and kept on practicing the Librarius after the Council of Nikea. So what this does is any model with this oath and the character subtype may be given the Warp Torrent Psychic Weapon. Any model with both the oath and the independent character special rule, because it that will also include the character rule gains the what torrent psychic weapon as well as being able to pay 25 points for access to a psychic discipline so you can have three hq choices all with a psychic discipline like the thousand sons can the drawback to this drawback is that you've got to select one of your hqs and two character types so minimum just as an example you two troops to have those warp torrents so not as flexible of like oh just my leader is a prayer to a psyker but if you're selecting this largely you're going to want a fair few of your characters to have psychic powers otherwise you just take a librarian now what the warp torrent does is it's got two modes if you're using it without effectively a chosen perils of the warp test it's a range 12 strength 5 ap5 assault 2 deflagrate weapon so a volkite 
charger with less range. If you choose to take a voluntary perils, you instead gain the AP 3 and the assault 2 plus the amount of wounds you took as part of that peril. So you're actually going to want to be taking 3 wounds from that perils. I suppose even with the additional strength, which I, sorry I missed out, so your strength of five increases for each wound caused by your malignant perils. Even then, even if you get to doubling out at strength eight because you took three wounds from the perils, I don't think it's worth it because you're only AP three. It's not worth taking damage all the time on your own force to shoot a range 12 AP three weapon. AP three, I don't think is in a great place at the moment because of how wound bouncing works in that oh it's an ap3 i'll tank it on my two up and largely just ignore it oh now it's an ap2 i'll take it on my three ups ap3 is in this sort of bad place because it can largely be ignored like any other ap of weapon so yeah not the biggest fan of the legacy of nike now this You've got to take the psychic power on two characters. It doesn't mean that you have to use it. I don't think it's that great. Gaining a Volkite Charger, not the best. It's good for flavor. It's again, like the flesh is weak. I don't think that great of an actual rule in how it's shook out. Causing damage to your own units to get a passable psychic power. Like he's, he's gonna, to get, a good version of the psychic power on the malignant uh, warp torrent. You're going to want to do three wounds to yourself, so that then kills 30 points of your own units minimum from three tactical marines. And then you have two thirds chance with each of those shots to kill an enemy, but they could also just tank that on one of their sergeants. So it, because it's only AP3. So I, ju I just don't personally think that it's worth it. Next we have the Broken Helix. So this represents the forces that were either cloned or the raptors in terms of the aberrance, abhorrence that are part of the Corax's Raven Guard after Istvan Fine. Although I suppose they're not particularly black shields, but they're best represented, I think, by this. So... Essentially, your units lose Fury of the Legion, Heart of the Legion, Spite, and the inexorable rule off your Terminators. In exchange for that, if you were clones, you gain a damage mitigation 5. Pretty good. You Any non-characters reduce their leadership and initiative by 1, so your sergeants don't reduce leadership. So if they're, if they're around or your apothecaries, you don't really care about leadership. And your initiative, largely, I find, in Thunderhammer meta, the things that do the most damage are even power axes or initiative one anyway, so you don't care too much. I mean, if you're going to go into the like the Raven's Talons route or something like that, you might want something with a higher initiative, in which case this would be bad. But a lot of the time, the stocky legions that are just... That you're going to be relying on that damage mitigation five more than anything else. You're not going to care as much. You'll just spec into something that's slower hitting anyway. So they're not that much of a downside. However, a unit that includes one or more models with this special rule may not make reactions and may also never be pinned. Not being pinned, very good. May not make reactions. Having played Mechanicum a fair amount, and against Phil's Mechanicum a fair amount, against other Mechanicums, not making reactions is horrible. I know your damage mitigation five, it, it's on all the time, so you don't need the Shrouded as much, and it's free. It does get ignored by things that double you out, but man, not being able to return fire, not being able to do move reactions to essentially get a four inch move, towards or away from your opponent if you're trying to assault or they're trying to assault <laughs> really big not being able to hold the line is massive so 
rad grenades are coming off all the time furious charge getting into those areas of being able to double you out much more frequently more attacks are going to be coming your way and if you're a shooting army obviously you're not doing your shooting reactions it it is absolutely crippling in the same way as losing by a different way but just as much as losing where your units are going to be shooting at um that we had on the fleshies week very much a a flavor army is the clones one now the abhorrence these are the for the for the raptors and other things like that all models with a special rule that does not have the character subtype reduce leadership and ballistic skill by one increase your strength by one permanently um and that, and that's the base strength so then your power fists i believe will be strength 10 because it's a, a base characteristic increase rather than a weapon effect or something like that after making a successful charge gain an additional plus one bonus to strength until the end of the player turn again really good and a unit that includes any models with a special rule that begins assault phase within 12 of one or more enemy units must declare a charge though the controlling player may choose the target of this charge if there's multiple very very good now the plus one strength being in there all the time stacking with power axes or other things that just get plus one strength incredible when you can get those rag grenades off um great frost blades come to mind for having plus two strength in there with ap2 um before initiative one so then you'll be strength seven all the time and plus one strength on the charge means that when you're charging you strength eight and doubling out unless obviously that's denied an incredibly good stack i think so long as you can pop someone's hold the line somewhere else or have multiple units with those great frost blades and that ties in i suppose into the 13th company as well which would be another abhorrent legion so it's got some nice little things that can stack into there and it doesn't have the crippling drawback that clone does because it's if you are going to be within 12 again a lot of the time you want to be trying to make those charges so that you get the surge move anyway and it's yes sometimes it's going to bite you in the ass because a last cannon squad is just going to kill seven or eight people but other times you're just going to be charging up there anyway and it's going to be worth taking those casualties to just get in faster so next we get in disgrace we are all equal and this is one of my favorite ones so you're not permitted to take any hqs and not have any warlords so you won't get a warlord trait instead all units with the character subtype so that's all your sergeants gain plus one leadership plus one wound and plus one to one of the following characteristics so that's from the list of weapon skill ballistic skill strength or initiative so even your tactical sergeants are going to be weapon skill five you if you don't have the character subtype you get minus one to your leadership so you your petty warlord of the squad sergeant is going to be much more vital to having your unit stick around um and if you basically if you're an apothecary or a tech marine you don't suffer the minus one leadership but also you don't get the benefits of being a character from this oath yeah he's this oath is so characterable for me it, it represents exactly what i think of as black shields being organized into these small war bands but after reading uh aaron Dembski bowden's night lords trilogy where the night lords legion sort of devolves into these types of war lands war bands like centered around their squad leaders that story to me transplants very nicely onto just black shields and yeah incredibly characterful one of my favorite ones in there i don't think it's the best but to me is one of the coolest because it's tailorable and there's no center of power you, it denies your opponent i suppose to slay the warlord which denies for whom the bell tolls and headhunter leviathals additional points for slay the warlord because you have none and yeah it's, it's just very very characterful 
and actually quite decent, like he's decent as well, even if not the best. We've next got Pride in our armor. Pride is our armor. The that is veteran squads in the primary detachment or an allied detachment may be upgraded for 50 points per unit, gaining line, heart of the legion, fury of the legion. However, a detachment with its oath cannot take any troops choices. Instead, your elites become your elite choices become core, and you get an additional two elite selections as your base army list. Now that has actual like wider connotations because you won't then have access to jump packs because they're in other the outside of Moritats and destroyer squads because those will be troops choices which you no longer have access to you won't have despoiler squads or tactical squads for very cheap line units i think the 50 points is too harsh for what this oath ends up doing I like the idea of the oath. I like gaining heart and fury and line on veterans. But I already think the downsides in there of not having access to troops, you're more limited in what you can take. I mean, I know they they seem to really value the, the elite slot, like say in Pride of the Legion, where they limit the amount of heavy support or fast you can take. But... 50 points for no actual models to just gain heart and fury and line seems absolute craziness to me. So it's one that I would personally avoid, even if I actually quite like the idea of them all being veterans. And it's this is the one that sort of ties into me with the old rules of Black Shields, which we haven't seen the Marauder, uh, the Marauder squads in the list so that for anyone that doesn't know from book six gave us an up to 15 or 20 man squad that was sort of a half veteran half tactical marine you could arm them all differently one in five could take a special weapon good like be ranging between good and absolutely crap and like sniper rifles when they were really bad just rendered on sixes with lookout sirs being in there um up to like power weapons and you could take shotguns and two bolt pistols. This sort of ties into that by prioritizing the veteran in the list. So I, I quite like it in that way, where you can get these more different hodgepodge units. On the flip side of it, the 50 points is just far too much for what he's trying to do, in my opinion. Next we've got, Next we've got the Taint of the Xenos. This is where you gain access to Xenos Deathlocks, Xenos Doom Locks, and Xenos Halo Blades, which is like just alternate pieces of war gear. And this is one of two sort of Black Shield special war gear lists. Now, I would have liked to see these just as standard within the Black Shield list without having to take an oath to be able to take them. Because just having, I don't think you should be paying an oath point out of your two oath points to have access to a Black Shield's armory when legions just have their own special armories anyway as well as their legion special rule so let's have a look what we've got essentially you may exchange a plasma gun or nemesis bolter for a xenoth deathlock for no additional cost a combi bolter for a xenoth deathlock for five points plasma pistol no additional cost but they're over costed anyway and a xenos halo blade instead of a power weapon at no additional cost what do these do? Xenoth Deathlock is a range 18, strength 6, AP 4, assault 2, deflagrate, and lethal exposure. What does lethal exposure do? So this would be, when you make one or more shooting attacks, um, included as part of reaction, roll a d6. If the number is equal to or less than the number of weapons with this special rule in the unit, you suffer a single wound. So if I have three weapons that are xenos deathlocks in my unit i roll the dice on a three or less i take a wound so if you have like a big support squad that have all changed out to a xenos deathlock you you're going to be taking a wound every time you fire them which is craziness now even with that is it worth changing out from a plasma gun 
at strength seven AP four with with breaching four to something that doesn't have breach. But I know you get an extra shot at ranges thirteen to eighteen because it's assault two. But even with deflagrate, allowing armor saves to let's be real, the most armies are marine armies, right? We all know that allowing armor saves because of that AP four just means that it's a pretty pointless trade out. And then you've got the lethal exposure rule, which is just going to be killing your own dudes every time if you have a meaningful amount. Because this is most comparable to a Bulkite Charger, uh, which is 15 inch range, strength 5, deflagrate, assault 2. Yes, it's got AP5 instead of AP4 on the charge, AP5 on the Charger instead of AP4. But both of those allow Marines their full saves anyway, so you just don't care. It's, I, I don't think it is worth the trade out. The Xenos Doom Lock, which is instead of um, the Plasma Pistol, 9 inch range, strength 6, a pistol 2, so an extra shot, like a Volkite Serpenta with lethal exposure, it just suffers from the same. Finally, we've got the Xenos Halo Blade, which is plus 3 strength, AP 3, melee 2 handed. Um, it doesn't have the, lean, uh, the lethal exposure rule, which is good, right? If you stack this with the abhorrent special rule for that plus one strength, you're then strength eight at AP three, which is like the sweet spot. You just always strength eight. Um, and you're just relying on them to roll like ones to fail their two up saves when you run into a unit with two up saves. Um, and yeah, it, it can be put on anything that could take a power weapon. So that could come in on lots of things like assault squads, despoiler squads at the lower end, and then up to veteran squads just absolutely stocked with them. And you just spam them and run at people and have a high strength that will double anyone out. It's, it could be very, very effective. So this is where it's sort of worth taking this oath to play around with things like that. The Xenoth Deathlock and Doomlock are just completely not worth it, I don't think. Now, there is one thing that I've not mentioned, which is that Vigilators can change their Mastercrafted Nemesis Bolter for a Xenoth Deathlock at no additional cost. I will leave it open as like I, my feelings unsaid over whether or not you should do that. Though I think we all know where I would go with that choice in the Armoury. It's a bit... Next, we have like completely opposite end of the scale of what I think about this armory. Is there anything particularly useful you could do with weapons of desperation? Probably not. Is it one of my favorite oaths? Yes. Right, so essentially what this is, is you guys have run out of ammo and have started picking up the weapons of the militia and guardsmen. So essentially, any unit with bolters or bolt pistols can change them for one of the following. So that's auto pistols, shotguns, auto rifles, stub carbines, heavy stubbers, um, las pistols, las guns, las carbines. And they're listed here with their actual types. Now you have a further special rule, which means that because you're a, a legionary that isn't just like a, a mook guardsman firing these, anything that's assault or rapid fire gains the pistol two special rule and anything that's heavy gains the assault special rule. So anyone with a bolt pistol or, or bolter can change for anything on that list except for heavy stubbers and fire it in both hands because it gains the pistol special rule with pistol two so it's kind of cool right now you could have two sawn off shotguns on the from the gaining the shotguns not a starty shotgun so not quite as good but very flavorful for like setting the tone of your forces these guys that are just really at the last ends and trying to hold it together and just keeping fighting however they can love it absolutely love it now one of the things, only one in three can exchange their bolter bolt pistol for a heavy stubber. Um, 
And that's because it, it's 36 inch range, it will be Assault 3, Strength 4, AP 6. Now, <laughs> it's sort of, I know I suppose you could just do both of your tactical squads all with 10 heavy stubbers, if not, which would look weird. But I don't think that's game-breakingly good that they had to put this in. Like, it would have made more sense to me that, like, one in ten could take the heavy stubber. Because that's then at least representing that guy that is, like, the, the heavy weapons guy. But, yeah, I, I think that's a bit of a superfluous rule. But I still like how all of these have set up and how they're included and how marines can move and fire with them much more easily than the guard it it just i love this oath basically and it's not very good i don't think but it doesn't stop me from really liking it it's peak black shields actually it's not the last thing in the book but that last thing isn't going to be a negative one we've got endred ha the unique character who at 165 points with weapon skill 6 Strength 4 and Toughness 5, 3 Wounds, Initiative 4, 4 Attacks, Leadership 10, 2 Up Save, Prayer to Level, basically. Like, once you've got a couple of weapons onto your Prayer to, they're clocking in at about that number of points. It comes with an Archaeotech Pistol, which is a bit... Uh, it's, it, it's certainly a thing. It's not a thing that will frequently or make you look at a character and go, oh yeah, brilliant. But the Terror Watt Pattern Power Gauntlet, is i would say very good essentially it's a thunder hammer with two times two strength ap2 brutal two specialist unwieldy all the same right but the charged attacks the charged attacks special rule means that you can halve your number of attacks and go to strength times three now that strength times three will be useful in going into tanks anything with battle hardened one um, it will be useful against Sons of Horus because you will still be doubling out their elite units even in that first round of combat. And then you can switch back to times two for rounds two and three. So very useful there. And you, obviously that is the downside of fighting Sons of Horus is that you won't double them out with your Thunder Hammers. Here you will. It also means because it's unwieldy, your initiative of four doesn't really matter because your weapon going to be going at initiative one anyway fine you've got an iron halo for your four up save pretty standard frag crack artificer all of them just perfectly fine for the points i think it's immediately worth it there but then you also have um legion of Sighties black shields obviously you're unique so you won't benefit from any of those black shields rules but obviously you won't suffer the drawbacks of those so it's a fairly cheap way of getting a Master of the Legion in, or at least a normal um, level of points for a slightly better Master of the Legion. You also have Hatred World Eaters, which is obviously situational, but okay. He's, well, excellent in the situations where it's excellent, nothing in the situations where it's nothing. So <laughs> it's, it's just a nice fluffy rule to have on Endred Har. And then finally, you've got Battle Hardened 1 which with his toughness 5 will mean it needs to be strength 12, which is like strength Primark Hammer to double him out, which is very, very good, actually. Um, any Primarchs without Brutal, if even if they've got a high strength weapon, and so long as they don't get instant death, won't be doubling him out. So he's, he's that nice little spot there, I think, that it just adds that extra survivability to have to get to that strength 12. And I like it. For, for the amount of points that Endred Har is, the Toughness 5 and Battle Hardened 1, I don't think it's overpowered. I mean, against a normal Praetor, the Toughness 5 or Battle Hardened 1, which we already see in the game with Salamanders, are obviously very good. But there's nothing that's overwhelmingly like rage inducing about Endred Har. I think he's a, a well written character. Um, and then your Fangs of the Emperor, Warlord trait, you've obviously got to have this. Three units that don't have bulky, infantry units that is, gain scout, and you get an additional assault phase reaction, which ties in with your Black Shields rules. Um, 
And I, I think it suits well. It, it suits the Black Shields. It suits Endred Ha. Um, and is a solid rule to have it. Obviously, you can come on from outflank from that. You can just scout up the board and reposition slightly after you've rolled, someone's rolled to seize. Um, and I think he's a, actually a very good character. <laughs> and I thought it was going to be a positive note to end on. And then Endred Ha, another positive note to end on. So it's not like when we do a vehicle guide and <laughs> and I end up being like, oh, the end of the guide is rubbish. No, I'm actually really happy with how these rules have come together. Really happy with Endured Ha. Um, and we'll leave it there. Please enjoy the next videos that are coming out where I'm going to go over Solar Exilia next. I'm going to be joined by James to do, hopefully, to do the Shattered Legions, which are a bit more involved and there's a bit more to say about them, as well as the characters which we're just going to focus off on one of the shortest videos or just wherever they fit in the timeline. So hopefully you enjoy then and I'll catch you next time in a bit.